Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 94 of the podcast. I'm taking some time off over the next two weeks, so I recorded this intro early. But you're in for a treat this week as I have a wonderful conversation with Ellen Rowland. We talk about how she discovered unschooling and what the transition looked like, her book, Everything I Thought I Knew, how she broke the cycle of controlling and critical parenting that she grew up with, whether it's possible to juggle it all, the most unexpected but awesome thing she's found so far from choosing unschooling, and much more. I hope you enjoy our conversation, and I'll catch you all up when I return. And now, on to the interview with Ellen. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and today I'm here with Ellen Rowland. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Pam. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us. I'm really excited to speak with you. And as a bit of an introduction for people, uh, back in 2008, Ellen and her husband Richard decided to leave the U.S. and move to Senegal, West Africa, with their two children who were ages three and four at the time. Then... They were there for eight years and moved to a small island off the Turkish coast of Greece. And all the while, they've been unschooling their kids. She recently published a book about what she's discovered about life and learning along the way. And I'm really excited to dive into your unschooling adventures, Ellen. Thank you. (laughs) So to get us started, can you share with us a bit about you and your family and how you first came across the idea of unschooling? Sure. Um, We're a a bilingual family. My husband is French and I'm American. And um, our two children uh, now are, my son is 13 and my daughter Sunny is 12. So they're 11 months apart, Irish twins, (laughs) um, which is really fitting because I'm from Irish heritage. Um, And I would say we didn't really come across unschooling. It was more like unschooling came to us. It kind of knocked on the door and said, uh, excuse me, I think you could use my services because what you're doing right really isn't working for anyone in your family. I love that. <laughs> when we moved to Senegal, we put the children into a preschool and I was invited to teach English there. And so I got a firsthand look into what really happens in a school. And it was pretty disturbing. Um, it was mostly about obeying And a lot of these children, uh, particularly the Senegalese children, had never experienced being controlled in that way. Most of their lives had been lived in complete freedom within their villages. And so my kids were really struggling because they didn't speak French fluently at that point. And all of the classes were taught in French. And they were frequently reprimanded for that. And it was really, you know, it was very hurtful for them and sort of not very conducive to learning. And in addition to that, I I loved teaching these kids um, English, but the administration came to me one day and said, you know, your kids are laughing too much. They're making too much noise. They seem like they're having way too much of a good time. So obviously they're not learning anything. And yeah. And I thought, that's just the most ridiculous thing in the world because they they were learning probably more than they would have if I had you know set them in a class and, and taught them in a very strict manner. So we decided um, with my husband's support to I resigned and we took our children out of school, and I decided that I would be the homeschooling teacher, and that lasted about two weeks. <laughs> 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 and at about that time, at the same time, um, I had written an article about the process of building our earth house and I was looking for a publisher and I came across natural life magazine, which is edited by Wendy Priesnitz and, uh, she agreed to publish it. And I started looking through their website and came across a link to life learning magazine. And I clicked on it and spent the next three days, uh, just 
devouring the archives. And I was absolutely astounded about all these stories of how kids could learn without a curriculum and without textbooks. And so we very slowly um, started embracing unschooling. Wow. That's, that is totally serendipitous. And absolutely. Just, just amazing connections because, because you're open for it. You see that that's one of the things I love about the journey is that we notice the things when we're ready. Like if, if you weren't in a place, you might not even notice that link, right. Or might not have clicked on it, but, but there was just this little something that wasn't sitting right and that made you click. And then all of a sudden there goes three days, right? <laughs> it is. And yeah. And after those three days, it didn't stop. I, you know, all of a sudden I would just Every time I would seem to go online, something about unschooling would pop up. And I thought, okay, this is, you know, a big, huge message from the universe that I need to to start doing this. Yeah. So from that point, then, what did your kind of journey or move to unschooling with your kids look like? Well, um, I was traditionally educated and my husband is self-taught, so he was very at ease with it. Um, it came very naturally to him. It, for me, it was just rife with uncertainty and self-doubt and really struggling with believing that my children could learn without being taught. And um, I also, um, you know, every once in a while, I try to kind of like sneak a subject in. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I just sort of like, well, today, kids, maybe we should really work on on, on spelling. And I would say, okay. So uh, how do we spell B? And they would say B-E-E. Hey, mom, how do, how do bees make, mon- uh, make honey, for mm-hmm. example? And um, th- then we would go off on this tangent, and I would get all stressed out thinking, well, no, but we were, we were working on spelling. spelling. <laughs> and, yeah, let's go back to spelling. And, but it was a great experience because it actually helped me realize that learning is, is, is not linear, and it shouldn't be, and that it needs to follow a very natural path. So my kids ended up teaching me probably more than I ever thought I could teach them in this process about how how learning takes place. Because, we, you know, we forget how we learned as a kid. And mm-hmm. so I've been actually able to apply that to my own life, which is wonderful. Yeah, I, I mean, I've said that so many times. I learned so much more from my kids about how to to live really right to, to live and learn and attack life. Yes. Yes. It's beautiful. It's it's not just about, it's not just about learning and it's not just about the kids. It, it ends up being an entire, uh, embracing an entire lifestyle. And, and I love that you actually use the term unschooling life because it's, it's not like we can say, we're exactly like the Joneses. We look everything completely normal, except we unschool. Cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it introduces every aspect of our lives, and uh, as it as it should. So. Yeah. No, that's a great point, and I loved your point too about. Um, I, I think that's just part of de-schooling. Is is you know you said you, but we're focusing on spelling for a moment. Like even. I think it, it does help us to realize, you know, what are the the stopping blocks or the stumbling places for ourselves. And then see you looked at that situation through that lens of spelling, because that's something that came up for you. Um, you know, even if we don't specifically approach our kids on it, we start to um, see what they're doing within that context. And like you said, we discover so much more than we were first looking for, but you have to be open to noticing that, don't you? Or like if you were totally focused on keep bringing them back to spelling, back to spelling, back to spelling, you wouldn't have noticed all the interesting places that it naturally went. So that it's important, isn't it? To have a bit of an open mind when you're approaching all this. I think, I think it's not just important. I think it's, it's absolutely essential. Um, Mm -hmm. Particularly if you come from a traditionally educated background um, if, if you're not open to it, uh, then it's just not going to work. And you're going to sort of end up saying that you're, you're embracing self-directed learning or, or unschooling or whatever you'd like to call it. Um, but that, that letting go process for, at least for me was slow and long. And I, mm-hmm. to be completely honest with you, Pam, I, I still sometimes struggle with it. Um, oh, yeah. it's, 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 it's hard. And I think, um, 
particularly if we let ourselves be preoccupied with what other people think. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, most of us are conditioned to care what other people think. And I think yeah, that's um, that's one of the was the one of the biggest stumbling blocks for me was letting go of that and saying, I'm going to we're on our own path and it is what it is. And it's wonderful. And they'll just have to deal. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's in possibly hard to compare because the paths are so different because I love the point when you were talking about hi I'm gonna keep up with the Joneses for everything but we're unschooling (laughs) our education piece like to me when somebody's thinking like that you know that they're early on in the journey because for unschooling to work really well even for the academics you need to realize um how it works and it inevitably reaches more than just that. Right. I mean, if you're not, it, yeah, it does. Because if you're not, um, how can, how can you truly understand that to learn any of those pieces academically at any point in their lives is okay. So that you release that, that fear of not following a curriculum And not apply that to all the learning that they're doing in their lives, because learning is learning. And and to understand that you're learning every moment of the day affects your whole day and your whole life, not just the academic piece. Right. Yes. And I in in our case, um, I also had to let go of the the idea of a schedule Mm -hmm. of children, Mm -hmm. understanding that my kids didn't necessarily have to read by age six or seven that they could take their time. And when they were ready, um, it would happen. Uh, that, that, that process took a long time because my children actually didn't learn to read until they were about 10 and 11. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when they did decide to learn to read and it was, uh, it was intrinsically motivated in my son's case, uh, he wanted to learn about geography. And I said, that's great. But you know, if you want to learn about geography, you're going to have to learn how to read. And he said, okay. And within a few weeks, he was online and he would ask questions and it it worked out. Um, And within six months, he was reading fluently in both French and English. So, and I can't tell you how. Um, I can tell you how I guided him, but it it did happen. And I think um, that's really hard for people to accept. I think parents, when they're first embracing unschooling, to really understand and trust in the fact that they will learn everything they need to learn. I think another hard piece of that reading puzzle specifically, um, our, our journey to that, is understanding that. Because with school, reading really is the only way to take in information, right? So yes. So, so often you hear on schoolers, you know, I'll be much more relaxed once they learn to read. You, because they, they believe that is an essential <laughs> skill for learning to happen. Whereas part of the journey is realizing that's only, it's true, but only in school where reading is really the only way to take in information because that's how you're given all your information pretty much, right? Worksheets and textbooks and that kind of stuff. But out in the world, when you're not inside that system, there's so many other ways to take in information that it's not a stumbling block. But that's a huge piece of uh, the de-schooling puzzle, isn't it? It is. It is. And um, once we once we understand, once I understood that out in the world every day in life, um, that they would be motivated to learn those things at their own pace and for their own reasons and in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, Then once I saw that happening, I, I was able to let go. And it's been a wonderful experience ever since. Yeah, and I think that's another reason why I always like to call it a journey because you need to get some experience under your belt to see it happening, right? Because it's so different. You can't like look at your neighbors. Typically, some people, you know, are lucky to live um, in an area where they have access to um, un- unschoolers living their lives nearby. Um, but so often we need to um, be observing and open in our own lives to start seeing it in action, right? And then we get that trust. 
Well, that was definitely my case because when we were living in Senegal, and even still here in Greece, we're on this tiny island and we're the only family whose kids don't go to school. So yeah. um, for basically for our entire experience, we've been, um, I won't say isolated because I have an incredible support system through um, social networks, but not being able, as you said, to, to have that firsthand um, example right mm-hmm. next door. Um, yeah. So I think you're artic- probably, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, the, what I was going to say is that, uh, for me, that, that network and all of the wonderful blog bloggers out there and, and people who talk about unschooling was, was incredibly helpful for me. Oh, and, and me too. That, that was all I had. I remember we were, I think we'd been unschooling for about a year when I finally said there was there was a conference going, we're in uh, outside Toronto, and this was in South Carolina, uh, one of the I think it was the second Live and Learn conference, and I'm like, yeah, let's go because we can actually <laughs> see some unschoolers face to face for the first time. Be around other like-minded people. Woo-hoo. Yes, it was like coming home. A- anyway, we should probably move on to the next okay. question. Yes. Go ahead. Next question. <laughs> next question. Um, and you may have touched on it a bit already, but what did you find the most challenging paradigm shift as you w- uh, were shifting to unschooling? Yeah, I, I it was really, um, for me, learning to trust uh, in the process. Mm-hmm. We did cover that to really understand um, that they would learn without without being taught and that they would do it naturally and pretty much seamlessly. Um sort of challenging those preconceived notions about how traditional education works and um, and being able and open, as you said, to to seeing what natural learning looks like. That was that was the hardest part for the kids. It was easy. I mean, they <laughs> they yeah. just dove they just dove right in since they, they really had only gone to preschool for about six months. So um, it wasn't like they had a, a you know, a long deschooling process to go through. I was the one who was struggling the most. So. Yeah, I've always found that my kids are are were the guide on on the journey, right? Because absolutely, what, when you give them that space and to see them in action, how capable they are, how quickly they learn things, it's just just so fun to watch them in action. Yes. Um, okay, you recently published a great book. I really enjoyed reading it, and it's called <laughs> "Everything I Thought I Knew: An Exploration of Life and Learning." I really enjoyed reading it, and I love yeah. I love that you organized the chapters around the alphabet. I thought that was very cool. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of, that was kind of a, a wink at the the icon of ABC. Exactly, <laughs> so fun. <laughs> I was like zooming through the table of contents to like see the <laughs> the first word for each of each of the letters. That was awesome. Good. Uh, but in the M chapter, you have a section called motherhood in which you talk about your decision to break the cycle of controlling and critical parenting that you grew up with. So I was hoping you could share with us a bit about that process, how you began that change. Yes. Um, this piece I actually wrote as a, as a blog post and, um, it was, it was a very difficult piece for me to write because it, it was extremely personal and, um, but I, I felt like it needed to be written and that I needed to put it out there. And I'm so glad that I did because it resonated with so many people. Um, I got messages from parents, from parents all from all over the world who said, you know, thank you so much for sharing your story. I was raised with a controlling parent or an abusive parent, uh, or, you know, uh, somebody who was not particularly peaceful and it's really affected my relationship with my children. And I'm so glad to know that I'm not alone. So I decided to include it in the book, um, in the hopes that it would sort of maybe help somebody else who might be going through that and wanting to embrace peaceful parenting, having been raised, um, in a different way. And I, I think Pam, when we, when we talk or we read about peaceful parenting, it sounds so natural and it makes so much sense to us. You know, we think, no, I, you know, I don't want to control my children or dole out harsh punishments. I, I want to be patient and kind and loving. And logistically, it sounds natural and easy. And I'm sure there are a lot of parents for whom it, it might be easy. But 
there's there are people who are out there like me and particularly who were not raised in that in that kind of way where it's not at all intuitive and it's very difficult to put into practice. So as much as we say, I, you know, I don't want to be like my mother or I'll never parent like my father, chances are from a biological and psychological standpoint, we'll probably end up repeating that same behavior. So, you know, wounded children, they grow up to be wounded adults. So it's important that we have to first find a way to be gentle with ourselves before we can offer that to our children. And we have to heal our own wounds. And that might mean therapy or meditation or learning about peaceful parenting through books or blogs or, or being, or even being part of a, a support group. So for me, um, the, the, the first step was really being conscious of the fact that I didn't like myself as a parent. And that was because I didn't know a different way. I, I had been parented with a, with a father who was very critical and who, who loved me, I'm sure very much. And, um, but that critical parenting got passed down and it's a term called transgenerational parenting. And it means that those sort of, they can even be ancestral wounds. It can, they can be passed down from generation to generation unless we consciously decide to break that cycle, uh, which is what I did. And in order to do that, the first thing that I decided to do is put everything on hold um, in my life, except for my children. And I got down on the floor with them because I really needed to understand what the world felt like from their perspective, how it's, how it's, it's challenging and it's so exciting and there's so much to learn and so much to conquer. And at the same time, it's overwhelming and scary. And so I got down on the floor with them and I, I sort of let myself be reminded what it's like to be a child. And I played with them and, um, you know, we built Lego and we sang songs and I, I, got a box of new box of crayons and I did coloring with my daughter and mm -hmm. I, I just really let myself be a kid again. And that was the first stepping point. And from then on, I just, uh, I went through a very long process of learning how to overcome, um, the tendencies that we have from being parented in a different way. And learning how to reframe that into something that I feel more comfortable with that's obviously helped me build a great relationship with my, my children. But it's not, it's not a fast, it's no, there's no magic bullet. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I, I wake up every day and, and say, okay, today I'm, I'm going to be more patient and more peaceful. And, um, but it's worth, it's been worth the journey. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that piece because I, I had goosebumps through most of it <laughs> because yeah. it's such a great point. Number one, I don't think many of us grew up, you know, with peaceful parenting in our homes, right? Yes. You know, it, it's not definitely not a conventional way to parent. And your point about how so much of that work is ours to do, because I love the word tendencies that you use, because those were the tools we grow up with. Those are the ones that are right there in our pocket that come out so easily and quickly if we don't take the time to, to do all this work, um, to be able to catch ourselves to do all the processing like so much I loved your story about getting down and just being with the kids to see things from their perspective because um that makes such a huge difference in every um situation in our relationship right when we're making choices to be able to see that moment from their perspective helps us come up with a couple other choices to make rather than the one that um, automatic instinctively comes to mind because that's the way we were raised. Right. But like you said, so much of it is our work to do, isn't it? It is. And, and, um, if, you know, we, we first have to, if we can't forgive ourselves, if we can't be gentle with ourselves, then it's very hard to offer that to our children. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and that, that personal work that I did, and I think a, a lot of parents go through, 
um, radiates out into every aspect of our lives and, and all of our relationships, not just those with our children. So we learn to be more peaceful people in, in general. And I think that that radiates out into even uh, how we look at the planet and how we decide to conduct our lives. And um, it just um, sort of calls calls us to be respectful. Mm-hmm. Again, back to the to, you know, unschooling is a lifestyle. It's a practice. Yes. It's a way you choose to live your days, right? Well, I don't think that you, honest, honestly, I, I've, I've come to the understanding, and, and you've probably heard this before, but I don't think that you can unschool and not be a peaceful parent. <laughs> um, I think it would be very, very complicated. And I think the two go hand in hand. And, and as for me, the, that tradi- that transition was very seamless um, to go mm-hmm. from being a pace- peaceful parent, learning how to be a peaceful parent, a gentle parent, and then transitioning into to unschooling. It was um, the two go sort of hand in hand. Yeah, they're they're just woven together. They they feed off each other, right? Yes. It's hard to imagine. I'm trying to imagine getting to one without the other. Yeah. And, and and you really can't because, you know, the trust and connection that you need for in a relationship with your child for unschooling to shine, to thrive is the kind of relationship um, in which peaceful parenting is needed. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that uh, that chapter um, started out as a blog post, and I would like to chat a little bit about your website. And I I love oh, the name, moneylife.com. <laughs> yes. I would love to hear the inspiration behind that beautiful metaphor for your unschooling lives, because when I go there, you just want to sink into that mud. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, it's um, obviously there's a little re- a literal reference, and that is that during the time that we were building our house in Senegal, which was an earth house, um, which is basically made of mud and, and water. We don't have time to go into it, but it's, it was (laughs) incredibly interesting process. Um, and so we spent about the first year literally covered in mud. (laughs) Um, You know, most parents are worried that their kids will get dirty. So they see a mud puddle and they steer them away from it. Oh honey, don't go through there. And uh, we were like, okay, guys, get in there, get going on those mud bricks. We got a wall to finish. So, <laughs> we, were, we were encouraging it, and um, and it was great fun, and it was an incredible learning experience. And uh, so that's that's kind of how I came up with the name A Muddy Life. But the metaphor um, is that I think when when we choose to live differently, and when we move outside of the status quo. And we make the decision to live our lives according to what makes us happy and what feeds our soul and what makes sense for the family. And uh, it, it, then our lives become hard to define. They become authentic and individual, but the lines get blurred and sort of murky and muddy. And so that's, that's kind of the, the metaphor is that you, you can't define it. Um, it's, it's something very individual and unique and muddy and messy and wonderful. And that's when it gets interesting. So that's, that's our muddy life. And I hope, I hope that a lot of people embrace their own muddy life. Yeah, no, I loved, I loved that. That's why I wanted to to share that because it's such a, it's such a wonderful image too. But like you said, the metaphor works so well. So, you know, whatever connection people can take from it, I think that's awesome. Yes. Um, getting back to your book, I wanted to visit the J chapter with you uh, for a moment. Okay. Juggle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you open the chapter by saying parents who are interested in moving away from a traditional schooling situation and educating their children at home often want to know how it's possible to balance family, work, and personal time. And I know that is such a common concern. So yeah. I would like to ask you how you answer the question, how is it possible to juggle it all? It's not, <laughs> <laughs> which is the whole point. I, I, I say in the book that juggling as a life metaphor is absolutely impossible and it should be left to circus clowns and street performers. <laughs> um, when we When we try to juggle, life and work and, uh, grocery shopping and 
being there for our kids, basically what happened and our own needs, basically what happens is that um, when you're trying to keep all those metaphoric balls up in the air, not one thing or any one person gets your full attention. So you're, you're scattered. And when things are scattered, you lose your attention and all those balls fall on the floor and, uh, and it's basically chaos. So my, my way of explaining how we ju- we quote unquote juggle those things is that, um, it's okay when you're in an unschooling situation and you're there to guide your children to ask for the time that you need to work on, um, for example, if I need to, to write an article or my husband needs to design a house, um, it's okay to ask for that time and to say, okay, uh, guys, I really, I'm there for you and your question is really important and I want to, you know, help you learn about Chinese history, but I need half an hour to finish this article. And uh, the same using following the metaphor, uh, it goes both ways. When I say to the kids, um, you know, guys, can you please help me set the table or do you want to help me make dinner? If they're in the middle of an important project, that respect goes both ways. And they say, sure, mom, I'm, I'm happy to help you, but I need half an hour to work on my thing. So it's really about um, finding a rhythm and um, a respect, mutual respect for everybody's needs and what they need to get done. And uh, it doesn't always work smoothly, but in our family, we, we've sort of, it's become kind of intuitive. And um, as the children particularly have gotten older, it works really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I really wanted to share that answer because I thought it was so valuable. Like, I love the way you replace the word balance with rhythm because that works so much um better as as like a metaphor because like you said when you're throwing balls up in the air and trying to give like that balanced attention to each one what you're really doing is scattering your attention like you said because you're not giving your full attention to any one of them right it's like oh but i need to balance them i need to balance them and you're not paying attention and the um yeah the the point about I love when you were talking about how kind of intuitive it is now because it it ends up just being about figuring out how to how to live together, right? To to mesh everybody's needs, that flow, that rhythm. And at the root of all that, to be able to do that, I think, is what you need. Uh, what you need to facilitate that is that trusting relationship, right? So that when you say, in uh, when I finish my article or they say in a half an hour or, you know, whatever that give and take is that people will come back to the table, right? That trust is so valuable. Oh, it's, it's, it's essential because then it, it sets up, um, an understanding that, okay, she's going to keep her word. She said that, you know, in half yeah. it's going to come, uh, help me, um, learn how to change a tire. Well, that would actually probably be my husband, but, um, <laughs> uh, that, she's going to keep her word and it's going to happen. And once you learn to trust in that, then it's much easier to accept, um, that you might not get an answer exactly when, when you want it. Um, and it's, it's all goes back to the kind of theme that's developing in this conversation about uh, it being an unschooling life. It's not Mm -hmm. just about, it's just about learning. It's, um, it has to be, it's a family choice. And it has to to work for everyone. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Exactly. There have been threads of of unschooling and peaceful parenting and how they all weave together throughout this whole conversation. It it is a lifestyle. It's not not real for it to work well. You can't just choose to do it in this little pocket of your life, right? And then be somebody else in the other times or the other places. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And and that's where it goes gets back to how we live together, the rhythm of our lives together, the trusting and connection connected relationship. Cause you know what? When at first you're like, I'm gonna replace school, right? You said no, no thanks to the preschool. And and you think, okay, this is how I'm gonna replace learning. But no, no, it's no. just way bigger than yeah. that. Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> as I said, the, the the homeschooling attempt with me as the teacher lasted about two weeks, and it was, uh, uh, it was pretty disastrous. Because we don't know, I, who, who knows how to teach, you know, if you're not trained as a teacher, 
um, you're sort of lost and you're out there struggling because you, you, you want to take on that role and it's just not natural for you. And, um, and it certainly wasn't natural for my kids to look at me that way. They'd be kind of snickering and, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I te- teach, teacher training too. Um, not that I've been through it, but I do ha- know some people who have, et cetera, but I think most of that is really focused on the management side. It, it's not yes. a lot about the, it's like, you know, okay, you figure out these worksheets here's cause they're already given the curriculum and, and yeah. their job is just deliver this curriculum. Right. So yes, they're, and they're becomes, fo- um, even, even for me, it became really uninteresting and I sort of, um, I got bored. So <laughs> if, mm-hmm. if I was bored, I knew that my kids, you know, why should my kids be paying attention? So um, it got so much more interesting when, uh, when we gave all that up and, and put the textbooks in a box and the, the curriculum alongside it and, and just, uh, just started living. Mm-hmm. That's when well, my, learning started taking place. So yeah, for me, what was super fascinating and how I figured it out because you know, the kids left school and, you know, it, it was a challenging atmosphere, certainly for my eldest, you know. So I said, OK, relax for a few weeks, take a bit of a vacation. Um, but then I I did the same thing. I'm like, well, you know, for learning, I ran out. It was like May, April, May, probably May. Anyway, so I picked up just a few workbooks. I'm like, this summer's almost here. We'll just do a little bit of workbooks and then we'll move on. But I had the same experience as you did, you know, trying to convince them to come for, I was like, it's just 10 minutes. Do a couple of worksheets, <laughs> a little bit of spelling, a little bit of math, and then you can play. And and it was, you know, like pulling teeth to get them to come. And, and so I was asking those questions because I'm like, well, come on, can't you just sacrifice 10 minutes and then get back to what you were doing? And, but it was taking like an hour because you had to kind of but but get them was, to come. Yeah. But you know, Pam, I'm sure you've realized this, that, that those attempts when we need to do that, that's not about them. That's all about us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what I been... our fears and saying, okay, well, I just, just a little bit of proof. I just want a little bit of proof that it's going to work. And, um, and so, you know, we, we try those things and that's all about our insecurities and the kids pick up on that too. And, and the important thing is, is being open, right? So I was paying attention and I was noticing why is this so hard for them? <laughs> and I was noticing that they sat down, they did it, you know, quickly. They had no problem with it. And then they went back to their things and I was watching them and they were learning just so much more yeah. in the things that they were doing the whole rest of the day than in that two minutes. And that, that, all that work for me um, was at the expense of our relationship, at yes. the expense of trust in each other. And like I, like with you, I think a couple of weeks is how long it lasted. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it was completely counterproductive to what we were trying to accomplish. So, yeah, yeah, but, I'm yeah. glad we moved off that that path quickly and on to on yeah. To- and I'm glad it only took a few weeks, right? <laughs> well, for that. For, for the curriculum piece. Yes, yes. Like you said, we're still, that's the thing, you know, because here we are again, unschooling as life, right? Yes. Life always has complications and challenges and things come up. And so, you know, there, I remember writing a blog post where, you know, I had, I used to think that once I could solve the problems that were on my plate, life would be good. But no. And then, yeah. And then I realized, oh, day to day through these things that come up in our lives is life. This is the good life that I'm that I can live. It's not waiting until some nebulous day in the future where, uh, you know, there's rainbows and cotton candy and everything's great. No, to, to realize that every day to show up and enjoy and be present in that moment with them, that is where all the beauty was. And that's where the mud is. Yes, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's muddy because it can't beautiful always be clean and pristine and beautiful. Sometimes it has to be messy. Oh, I love that. So I love that. fun. <laughs> Yep. Oh, exactly. And for our last question, okay, I 
Yes, I would love to know what has been the most unexpected but awesome thing that you found so far from choosing unschooling. Gosh, there are so many. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to choose one, but I would have to say, and I've mentioned I mentioned this earlier, but it's how much I've learned alongside my my children, just by os- osmosis, because you know you spend so much time with them. And, um, they're always sharing what they've learned in, in, with so much enthusiasm. And so you just can't help, but absorb, um, some of that, that knowledge. And it's been fascinating to me. I, I don't know if there are things that, um, that I never learned or I forgot <laughs> in school. Um, mm-hmm. but I feel like I know so much more now, um, <laughs> that I'm, I'm helping my, my children along their, their unschooling journey than I ever did. I feel like I'm actually smart now. <laughs> I love um, that. <laughs> the, the other thing um, I'm going to say too, cause I can't, it's really hard to define it down. Um, the other thing I would say, Pam, is that um, I've thankfully moved away from feeling isolated in my choice and feeling like, Oh my gosh, we're the only people who do this. And you know, we're the crazy people who live in the, in the mud house in the, in the bush of Africa. And, and there's well, his children don't go to school, um, to coming to, um, an understanding that there are people all over the world who are embracing unschooling, self-directed learning, will for learning, whatever you want to call it. And, and they're sharing their stories. And more and more, I think that because the the, pre, the press is starting to cover it, people are feeling like they can sort of, I hate to use this metaphor, but they could like they can come out of the closet, <laughs> mm. and um, and hearing those stories and being a part of that network of people in that community that's international and and global, um, being a part of that con- that collective consciousness um, is has been really wonderful for me and. Um, it's, uh, it's really helped me along my journey. And look, I'm, I'm here in Greece and, and you're in Canada and we just had an amazing conversation. So that's awesome. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I really, uh, I appreciate that perspective too, because you're right. The ability to connect and, and it's just exciting, isn't it? When you can, um, just connect with, with people all over the world and you could, it feel you're right. It's, it's, you don't feel so isolated anymore. It's like you, you read about someone here and here and their what their kids are up to and how they're being supported. And you don't feel so alone. You don't feel so for lack of a word, better word, crazy in your choices, right? Even though that might be the impression that you're getting from the immediate people around you, but you can rest in knowing that it's happening all over the place. That's beautiful. It is. I have, um, an, uh, on my blog, I have an, um, a counter which shows how many people have gone on and, and actually where they're coming from. And oh. so my, my son who is just crazy about geography made me a little world map. And so he goes on once a week with me on my blog and we say, Oh my gosh, somebody from Sri Lanka, somebody from Thailand, somebody from, you know, there's Americans and there's Canadians and Australians and, and people from these very obscure places all over the world, and you're saying, okay, so it's spreading. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I love how that connects with his love for geography. Isn't yes. that awesome? Like, th- this is learning. This is life. Things are so connected to each other, even un- unexpectedly, but it's so beautifully. And I love that point because just, just a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago, on the in the Q&A, um, episodes when we get questions from people we've Mm -hmm. I I added to the forum to add where you are because I love saying oh this uh, this question is from you know this person in Africa and in Japan and Canada and you know Australia all over the place so it's it's just so fun to see where people are and to know that they are working on this stuff like we said it's so much of our work to do but the, the beauty and the benefits for ourselves and for our children are just immense. So it, it is so nice to know that it's going on all over the place. It is. It's, a, it it's, is. it's global. <laughs> global and glorious. Global and glorious. I love that. Yay. 
yeah. Well, I think that might be a blog post, Pam. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Ellen. I had so much fun chatting with you. I had a wonderful time too, Pam. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. No, oh, that's lovely. I'm so glad that that we managed to yes. get a nice connection between Greece and Canada. Here we go. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and that and that the internet was working well today. <laughs> uh, fingers crossed. I know. And before we go, where's the best piece for place for people to connect with you online? Um, at my blog, which is a muddylife.com. Uh, Twitter, Ellen underscore Roland. Um, and yeah, that's the easiest is probably through my blog okay. or Facebook. Okay. I'm available on Facebook too. Ah, there you go. Okay. Well, I will put links to all that in the show notes and link to your book and your website and blog posts that we mentioned as well. So that's awesome. Thanks so much, Ellen. Have a great evening for Thanks. you. <laughs> you, Pam. you take good care. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the Tuck Talks. For six years, I hosted the Toronto Unschooling Conference. It was an amazing experience and I loved meeting many wonderful unschooling families. Though I no longer host the conference, the unschooling insights shared by the amazing speakers over the years are timeless. You can listen to all 25 talks for free on my website at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash conference. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.